Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is the High Performance Computing in Julia module. Uh, my name is Jamie. I'm a final year PhD student here at the University of Nottingham. My research is mainly into machine learning, focusing on sort of the intersection between machine learning and statistical physics. Um, I sort of came up with the idea for this module because uh, because of my research topics, I have to run a lot of code, a lot of simulations, and they have to be very fast to be able to get any results. And I had to learn a lot along the way, and I wanted to condense that into a module and make it available for, for others so their process is a bit easier. Uh, so the main aim is to provide a sort of mental model for all of you for like how a computer works so you can reason about your optimization strategies and sort of implementing parallel programming and things like that. Uh, this is just to make you best use of the hardware given. Next week we'll go over why we actually care about optimization, uh, but for now we'll just lay the sort of groundwork. Uh, later on uh, we will sort of visit a lot of topics in parallel computing, so we'll talk about some sort of hardware parallelism that you can do on a single CPU core, um, up to using a single computer with multi-threading, up to using an entire supercomputer cluster with multi-processing, and even being able to program GPUs. Uh, throughout this course, we'll do a mix of theory and sort of hands-on practice. So uh, after this week, the majority of the course will be uh, example-based uh, rather than theory-based. Uh, but I'm going to front load a lot of the theory so we can get on to actual practical examples. Uh, all of the sort of programming and examples will be done with Julia programming language. Hands up how many people have heard of Julia before this module? Anyone using it currently? Great, <laughs> at least one. <laughs> and and you, Constantina. <laughs> um, we're not going to go too in depth into teaching the very like nitty gritty syntax details of Julia, that's all included, um, which we'll go over later. Uh, yeah, so my main aim from this is to give you the skills and the sort of uh, preliminary knowledge so you can sort of learn for yourself after the module ends and sort of dive deeper into a lot of these topics. Uh, we only have sort of five weeks to cover these and there's a lot of depth to them, so sometimes we'll only sort of skim past the surface of a topic. So just an overview of this. Uh, this course was designed for MPAGs, which is the Midlands Physics uh, like Alliance Graduate Scheme, I think. Uh, and so this is a sort of uh, a graduate school for uh, PhDs from a few universities in the Midlands, so Warwick, Birmingham, Nottingham, Loughborough. Um, and we have a few people uh, from Warwick, at least, uh, joining us, which is why everything will be recorded. So everything will be in a hybrid session, so we'll do these lectures in person uh, here at Nottingham and we will also sort of record the lectures and make them available afterwards online and live stream. Uh, so this is assessed only for the PhD students um, or they're the only people who the assessment actually matters for. So MPAGS gives you some credits which you need to pass your PhD. Um, if you're undergrads, there's quite a few undergrads in this class. Again, no, uh, there's no sort of credits. Uh, there's no credits for this module. There's nothing you need to worry about in terms of assessment. That's just for practice for you. Um, for those who are being assessed, uh, this module, like the rest of MPAGs, is just pass fail. So there's no sort of first, second, third. You just pass or you don't. The way this works is by unit testing. So unit testing is you write some code that will test the code that you've written um, to make sure that uh, for a given input it creates the expected outputs and as long as those match then you'll pass the unit tests and if you pass the unit tests you'll pass the module. Um, most of the unit tests that I've written are for the sort of simple part of the task and then there'll be an extension afterwards so uh, I don't expect anyone to fail this it should be fairly straightforward to, to pass all of them. Uh, you have access to these unit tests as well, so you can test it and run it yourself. And if it works for you, then you you know you've passed. Yeah. So every week um, or every session, we'll do a sort of 
hybrid workshop will start a problem in the workshop and if you finish it in the workshop great if you don't finish it at home all of these will be delivered via github classroom which is just a way to sort of give you a, a starting place a template of your code um, that's shared with me as well so i can see it at the same time and so anyone uh, using git at the moment or has used github a lot before okay great uh, we won't be going into the details of Git, but next or next session on Thursday, I'll sort of do a, a small tutorial on just how to get the code and get things running. Okay. Also, I'm quick question for the homework. So once finish, should I push back to the repository? Or yeah. All you need to do, uh, if if you know anything about Git, is just um, finish the code as long as the unit tests work. You commit your code, and I'll be able to. Like unit tests, you mean those uh, local tests? You yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, I'll, yeah, all you do is push back and um, make sure it's sort of on the GitHub okay. side of things, and I'll be able to see it from there. Uh, there's no strict time limits on these either. Um, so if you do all of the assessments in week three, that's that's fine. I won't make you do week by week, but. Um, the first week is important just to get everything installed and set up. In terms of resources, most of you would have already seen the website. I'll try and keep that updated with details. So, for example, we had a room change today. I'll update the timetable um, with any room changes, and it might be easier just to check that before each session. Um, accompanying all of the lectures, I've written a lot of lecture, uh, lecture notes in just a big PDF file. Um, it goes over everything we'll talk about in class, but goes into more detail on some topics. Uh, it's still a work in progress. You guys will be the first to read it. So if there are any mistakes, just let me know and I'll, I'll try and fix it. Uh, you might need to download later versions if, if there are any substantial changes. Uh, most of the lecture notes are just work, uh, worked examples. Um, there's a lot of code examples there, so you can follow along with your computer and just make sure you understand everything that's uh, being covered. Uh, there is also uh, a large section of the book that goes um, or that talks about professional uh, software engineering skills. So version control, which is like Git, uh, documenting your code, writing unit tests, things like that. We're not going to specifically cover them in the lecture, but that's there just in case people are interested in that topic. We've already spoken about the GitHub Classroom. Now, this isn't specifically a module about teaching you how to use Julia. We'll cover some of it, but um, our main focus is talking about optimization and parallel computing. Uh, so there are a few resources. There's a whole chapter of the book dedicated to just the basic fundamentals in Julia, just some syntax and things like that. Um, the Julia manual online, so this is the official documentation is really good and if you check that out there's a section on coming from other programming languages so if you have a lot of experience in python there's a whole section of how you can translate your thinking in python to work in julia and there's ones for matlab and uh, c as well uh, if you're asking questions a lot of people use like stack overflow for things a lot of the information there is a little bit dated because julia has gone through a lot of revisions over the years um, so Stack Overflow might not be the best place to ask questions. There's not a huge community there, but there's the Julia Discourse Forum, which is the best place to ask questions. And if you ask something, you'll probably get a reply within an hour if you've sort of structured your question in, in a nice way, makes it easier for them to help you. Okay, any questions about this? No, great. So, uh, the topics that we're going to cover in this. So the first week, we'll just give a brief overview of um, some hardware and software. Uh, there's probably not many of you who are computer scientists. Uh, a lot of people will come from physics or other sort of STEM, STEM degrees other than computer science. So we'll just cover some basics from there. Uh, week two, we'll talk all about optimization. And so this is uh, making your code run as fast as possible just on a single uh, CPE core. Uh, we'll move on to parallel computing um, and using uh, sort of multi-threading, which is one way of doing parallel computing. Week four, we'll probably continue that trend and extend it to multi-processing. 
And then week five will be dedicated to GPU programming completely. Okay. So we'll start with the hardware section. So we'll just go over the bits of like what's inside a computer, just so everyone's at the exact same level. Bear with me. I know a lot of you will already know a lot of these details, but um, this is just to make sure everyone's at the same level when we start. So tell me what this is, anyone? Shout out. Motherboard. Exactly. All right. So this is just a computer motherboard. Motherboard is just sort of the glue that connects all of your components together. So there's nothing too special about it. It just connects all of your components together. Uh, we'll go on to talking about the easiest to most difficult. So one thing that all computers will have is some form of like permanent storage. And so usually people have hard disks and they plug into these um, five, where you can see these connectors on the right hand side of the motherboard. Um, and so permanent storage comes in two main types nowadays. You have hard disk drives, which have huge capacities, but they're quite slow. And they're also quite cheap as well. Um, but nowadays, most computers are using solid state drives, um, which have a sort of medium capacity, somewhat similar to normal hard drives nowadays, uh, but they're, they're more expensive, but they are a lot faster. If you look at the speeds I've put here, there's like an order of magnitude difference in speed. Um, exact ones will depend on the exact hardware, but um, the main reason for this is on the on the left you've got um, so these silver plates are actual spinning disks, um, and so whenever you have to like read a data, the um, the disk has to rotate into frame so you can actually read what's on there, or rotate to the correct place. And these little needles have to move to the right place, whereas a solid state drive is just a sort of chip that has all of the storage there. So that was the permanent memory, but uh, the second or a, another very important part is the main memory. So we call this RAM, random access memory, and they come in these little chips that you just slot into uh, the location shown on the motherboard. Um, so much to the form. Uh, the most important thing to know about this is it's, it's volatile, which means as soon as you switch the power off, it will lose all the information on it. Uh, they're quite expensive, like per gigabyte, per capacity, but they are a much higher speed. So we're talking another order of magnitude or two difference from the solid state drives. Um, but they have much lower capacity. Uh, so it's about an order of magnitude or two less capacity than your solid state drives. Um, but the, the speed that we're talking about here is more the bandwidth. So how much data can it copy per second? And there's also another component um, called latency, which is as how long does it take for me to, so from when I request the data, to get uh, a piece of data back as well. Um, and we'll talk more about this last point uh, later on, but this will store all of your active programs, all of your data that you have open, sort of uh, your operating system will live in main memory as well. And usually it gets copied from the hard drive into main memory when a process starts. Um, the way you can sort of think about memory is a huge table of data. So um, you can think of all of the memory that's stored in there um, just in these little chunks, which we call bytes. So a byte is eight bits of information and a bit is just a single zero or one. And in most computers, one byte is the smallest chunk of memory that you can um, put an address or give an address to. So even if you have some data that's only one bit, it will get stored in an eight bit chunk uh, or a one byte chunk. Uh, each of these bytes has an address associated with it. So these are just shown in binary, but essentially it's like at address two, you have the data all zeros. Um, we won't go into detail too much on this, but uh, if some of you have come from doing any C or C++, there's a lot of talk about pointers. Uh, and a pointer is basically just a piece of data, so in the right-hand side of this, that contains an address that points to another location in memory. 
hence the name. Okay. So I know you've gone through this quite fast, but we're at the most important part of the computer, uh, the central processing unit. So these are made by usually on desktop computers like Intel or AMD. Uh, and they they perform the bulk of the calculations. So the way they do this, they're, they're microprocessors and they contain billions of transistors, which are lit uh, little electronic components that can store and process ones and zeros. Uh, it's where all of your logic computations happen, like your arithmetic. It also has sections that interface with the memory and your storage and your network devices. And uh, it's basically the central brain of, of your computer. Um, modern day CPUs uh, contain multiple cores within them. And a CPU core you can think of as like a self-contained CPU. And there are multiple on each um, processing unit. We'll go into more detail about that later on. Also, um, we've talked about storage from the permanent storage to the main memory. The CPU also has some local storage as well. So on the, the memory that's stored on the CPU, it, again, it's volatile, the same as RAM. Uh, we call this the cache, and these are usually labeled in levels L1 to L3. So any questions up to this point? So most modern architectures are based on a very old model that dates back to, I think, the 50s, um, called the von Neumann architecture. And this sort of breaks the CPU um, down into a, a few different parts and provides a sort of basic model of how the CPU can actually process data. So the first main point about von Neumann architecture is both the data you're operating on and the instructions for your program are stored in main memory. So they're stored together on the same device. Um, and inside the CPU, you have um, what's called registers. So registers are just um, a sort of temporary uh, memory storage specific to the CPU inside. So the three in the middle, so MAR is the memory address register, MDR is the memory data register, and the CU is, I think, the control unit. Uh, which is a bit different to the register. So this is sort of like a fixed amount of storage and it's usually like 64 bits wide. On modern CPUs, it might be larger or, or smaller, depends on the architecture. Uh, the CPU also has a register called the program counter. So that's the PC up in the middle. And the program counter stores the address of the current instruction that you're executing. So when a, um, an instruction is being processed, um, the program counter will send that to the memory address register. Um, and then the memory address register will fetch the instruction from memory using that address into the memory data register. That's decoded in some way. So as you see, the, the data stored in memory is just zeros and ones. So you need to decode it to find out what that instruction actually represents. Um, and then uh, the process will execute whatever that instruction um, tells it to do. And this will go on in a, um, in a loop, basically until there are no more instructions. That's the sort of basic idea of memory. One thing that we haven't spoke about is these buses. Uh, a bus is, is literally just a connection along which the data can travel. So it just connects different parts together. So this is the sort of uh, granddad architecture of most of the modern microprocessors that we use today. So the sort of modern CPU architectures, um, the most sort of common made by Intel and AMD, uh, use an instruction set. So this is a mapping of those binary, um, uh, sort of binary labels into actual instructions. Um, and this is known as x86, which is 32 bits wide, so each instruction segment is 32-bit number, uh, or x86-64. So that's just the 64-bit version uh, on top. Now, usually we'd only have to worry about these, but nowadays 
there are a lot more different, well, say a lot more. It's another main architecture that you might need to think about is um, the ARM architecture. So the new Apple M1 processor uses ARM-based instructions, which are a sort of stripped down modern version of uh, sort of x86 process, x86 instructions or an alternative to x86. Uh, this is also used in like Qualcomm processors. So pretty much all of your phones will be running an ARM based uh, processor. If we have a look at what a CPU looks like sort of under the under the hood. Uh, it's pretty hard to tell what's going on on this image, so you can sort of label the sections on the right hand side and you see that modern processors still have this sort of memory interface uh, that we saw in the von Neumann architecture uh, but inside they don't just have one unit for doing your processing um, most of the time computers will have multiple cores that are capable of processing information at the same time uh, but what's really important is that um, modern CPUs have a shared cache which wasn't in the von Neumann uh, model that we saw. Where we think about cache is here is just let's say we have two cores of our CPU. Each core will have access to L1 cache, uh, which is very close to the CPU. And then the next level out is L2 cache and L3. And then finally, there's a sort of connection up to RAM. So anytime you want some data, let's say it's not in cache for now, it's just in RAM, the CPU has to um, send out an instruction to get that memory back and it will pass through all of these layers of cache trying to find the memory so it'll go to l1 it's not in l1 goes to l2 it's not in l2 goes to l3 not there and then it has to send a signal all the way to ram and uh, find the data there and then bring it back all through this cache but when it brings it back it should stay in the cache so the next time you ask for it let's say it stays in the l1 cache Instead of having to go through each level of cache and then out to RAM, it just goes to the L1 cache, finds the information there, and then sends it back to the CPU. And the main reason for doing this is because this trip out to RAM is very slow compared to how fast the CPU runs. So most CPUs run at like four gigahertz nowadays. Um, so that's every clock cycle. It does some amount of instructions. And that's sort of on the order of like a fifth of a nanosecond, whereas going to RAM is on the order of like 10 to 30 nanoseconds. So a CPU can sort of process 10 instructions in the same time it takes to get one address from memory. So there's this sort of mismatch of speed, which means that you need to have this like faster layer of cache in between in order to actually make use of the processor instead of having it just be bottlenecked by the memory speed. Um, this L1, L2, L3 cache is very expensive to make, and it has to be etched onto the same die as the CPU itself. Um, and they usually have a really small capacity. So while RAM could be 16 gigabytes of memory on a typical machine, your L1 cache is probably on the order of like 80 kilobytes. So that's like a few, yeah, that's like uh, a million times smaller around that order of magnitude. OK, uh, we'll talk about. Sorry, one thing. Yeah. Uh, is there like a categorization for what data gets sent into which cache? Or is it kind of a first come, first serve? It's very complicated, and it changes based on the CPU and also what the CPU is doing at the time <laughs> uh, as well. Um, this is, it's easier to think about this in a more abstract sense, but we will go over. Um, this in way more detail in the optimization section and even in the parallel section as well because it comes up again it's a very central part of uh, what makes uh, some operations very fast and what makes them very slow cool. but in theory yes you can check and oftentimes when people are diagnosing problems they check for cache misses so if um, they're expecting the data to be in cache and it's not there it's called a cache miss and that can be a big source of um, uh, of issues in your in your program or uh, performance issues. OK. So just to sort of summarize, uh, we've spoken about these three parts so the CPU, your RAM and your storage. And 
storage. Um, and then what we haven't spoken about, uh, which we'll cover later on in the course, is GPU. Uh, and the GPU slots into these um, much larger slots called PCI Express lanes. Um, and that essentially acts like its own mini computer as well. It has its own memory, has its own processing cores. The main difference between them is a GPU usually has thousands of GPU cores inside of it, whereas a normal CPU has four to 16 in that sort of region. Uh, we'll cover that in a lot more detail in the final week. Okay. So now we've got a brief overview of the software, uh, the hardware. Uh, we can talk about software. So just as a brief uh, cover here, uh, all computers pretty much use an operating system to run. And operating system is just some software that handles um, or like manages the resources of your computer. And it's a sort of abstraction um, to make developing software much easier. Also provides a lot of common utilities to sort of applications that run on the operating system. So for example, if you have a text editor, uh, you don't want to have to implement how do you deal with every distinct type of storage device and how do I read data from it and write data to it? You offload all of that to the operating system and the operating system sort of abstracts away reading and writing to files, interfacing with the network, just sort of common operations that most software uses. Uh, it's also in control of actually loading your programs into memory and scheduling them on the CPU. So most computers, even if it only has one core, will be able to run multiple programs at the same time. And it does this, or the operating system handles scheduling which program will run at which time. It also provides some like virtual memory space. So I said before, you can think of memory as a big table of information with physical addresses. Uh, most operating systems sort of abstract this away for each application running and give it a sort of virtual memory space so that it doesn't have to uh, keep track of where it is in the physical memory layout. So there are three main families of OS. Um, so Windows, the machine we're using now, everyone's used Windows. Uh, again, people will be familiar with Mac OS as well. There's one in the room. Uh, and Linux, hands up who's familiar with Linux. Okay, good, great. Um, Linux used to be a lot more obscure than it is today, but uh, it, it powers like 80, 90% of the internet. And uh, particular to this module, we're going to talk about how to write code for HPCs or supercomputers. And I don't know of any supercomputers that don't run Linux. It's, it's the main system that people develop um, sort of high performance software for. OK. Um, so yeah, just as a summary, we can think of the operating system as a sort of abstract layer that sits between your software applications and your hardware, and it will handle um, the sort of nitty gritty details uh, of how to do, how to write to a file, how to access a certain uh, system. Okay. So we've sort of alluded to this in our yeah, previously, but machines only understand binary, so ones and zeros. So you need some way of encoding the data that's stored in memory in order to actually process it effectively. And so we call this sort of a label of like how to interpret the data a type or a data type. And the operations that a CPU performs will be different based on the type of the data that you're dealing with. So even if you're adding two numbers together, it really matters if those two numbers are integers or if those two numbers are like have decimal values because they're represented differently in memory. So the common types you'll come across, um, hopefully everyone will have seen these before, is floating point numbers, it's basically just decimal values, uh, integers, the same as they are in, in normal maths, uh, Boolean values, which are just true and false, um, and also because um, computers deal with text a lot. There's also schemes for encoding characters as binary as well. And so the, the most sort of um, common uh, simple example is ASCII, which maps 
255 numbers onto basically the alphabet plus a few punctuation marks, numbers, special characters, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there's Unicode, which sort of extends that um, format to deal with like emojis, um, like kanji from, or basically alphabets from other languages, things like that. Okay, uh, we'll come on to that point in the next slide. So we'll talk about integers first because they're the easiest to think about. Um, so when you're just talking about like positive numbers, it's really easy to go from or to encode them because we just encode it the same way as we would uh, ourselves uh, manually. Signed integers are a little bit uh, different, but practically the same encoding scheme. So this is uh, eight bit number um, and we can represent the uh, we can represent numbers with uh, in binary in this way. So does anyone know what the number of the first row is? If you take that as a number, what would that be in like decimal? Nine, no, 17. Why are you saying 17? Because it's two to the power of three minus two to the power of one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So two to the power of three plus two to the power of one plus two to the power of zero. Oh, I mean, I actually missed the first. Uh, so that's eight plus two plus three. So that should be 11, I think. Um, so that's basically how you do it. So each, instead of having like 10, 100, 1,000 in the columns, you have two, oh, sorry, one, two, four, eight, 16, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the difference is when you're dealing with signed numbers, usually the way you represent it is you just put a minus sign on the header of the leading bit column. So uh, this number below is represented as minus two to the seven plus two to the zero. And two to the seven, I think, is 128. So that's minus 127 is the bottom number, is the way it's represented. Um, so if you're representing a number like this with eight bits, can anyone tell me what the range of values that you can represent are? Assigned integer. Yes. Uh, half of the magnitude of the leading bit on both sides of zero. So almost, negative very negative almost. Negative one, no, 127, so negative 127 to positive 127. Yes, you're, you're one off, but that's basically right. So yeah, if you have like one and all zeros, that's minus 128. And if you have all ones, that would be um, like almost, if you have all ones apart from the leading bit, that would be 127, I think. Um, so basically the number of bits you use um, sort of restricts what numbers you can actually store in that data type as well. Uh, and so these usually double each time. So you can, so for example, Boolean values are represented with eight bits and basically act just like integers. Uh, but the only restriction is their values can only be eight zeros or seven zeros and a one. Uh, most commonly, people use 64 uh, bits. Um, this sort of unsigned behavior is also why you see a lot of um, overflow errors. So if you have something, I know, like the count on a YouTube video, if that number gets too big and you add one to it, it will overflow to the negative numbers because what happens is you carry the one and it goes into the negative column and the number becomes negative. Okay. So floating point types, we've already said, are used to represent decimal values. Again, they can be, usually people use 16, 32, or 64. It doesn't really make sense to use eight bits for a floating point number. These are also sometimes referred to as half, single, or double. Um, but uh, we, you don't need to know it in that much detail. So the way a floating point encodes your data is it partitions it into sections. So if this is a 32-bit number, uh, the first leading bit is used as the sign. So that's just a zero or one to say whether it's positive or negative. Um, you have eight bits to represent the exponent. So this is like the, uh, the magnitude of the number, how big the number is. Um, and you have the mantissa, which is like your significant digits. Um, so this is very similar to the sort of scientific notation, like five times 10 to the power of 20, something like that. It's like a base two version of that. Pretty much every language uses 
um, IEEE 754 as the standard, which basically encodes how you should, um, or it, it sets out how you should encode floating point numbers, how the math works, et cetera, et cetera. Like it's, it's just a standard that's common across most languages. Uh, we've already said that. And so the way you sort of convert to a real number is by using this formula. You can see it's not quite a standard, like M isn't the significant digits. It has some um, like sort of offsets that are used. So for example, E has an offset of minus 127 so that it can represent very small numbers and very large numbers. Uh, and then as you can see, the S is just a zero or one, which just flips the sign on the number. Any questions about this? Nope. So you can see immediately if you have these bits in memory, the operation you have to do to add two floating point numbers together uh, is very dependent on how you've encoded it. And so knowing the data types is incredibly important, knowing which instructions or for the CPU to know how to process the data. OK. So those are the sort of low level or lower level details. But how do we actually like write software? So usually we use um, a sort of high level programming language that's sort of human readable, easy to understand, has easy rules. You don't have to keep a lot in your head to um, understand and write this. So we've given an example. This is just in Julia defining a function, much like you would do in maths, that takes some input x, does some um, processing on it and sort of returns a value, which is just a polynomial. But how do we actually get this sort of human readable text into some instructions that a CPU can actually execute? And so as a sort of representation of the instructions a CPU has, we usually call this sort of machine code. It's not quite machine code. This is assembly level, so we can still actually like read some of the instructions. You can see it's kind of gibberish. It's it's very hard to pass and it takes a lot of effort to understand what's going on. Also looks almost nothing like what we had on the left as well. Um, so people in the past had to learn to write assembly um, and then they have the assembly, which is pretty simple translation to go into the machine code. Um, but nowadays we use a compiler to do it. So the process of taking um, your sort of high level source code, human readable into machine code is called compilation. And uh, it's a complicated process. So uh, this is the sort of outline of how it happens in Julia. Um, but pretty much every language you have at some point has to take the text that you've written in your source code and translate it into instructions to run. Uh, this the sort of specifics vary a lot based on the language, but uh, we'll just sort of talk about how it happens for Julia here. So we start here, outlined in green as our source code, and then there are some steps to just sort of pass the source code into something that's easier to understand. So this gets passed into what's called an abstract syntax tree. It's just a data structure that makes it easier to um, perform operations on the code. Um, and then the code gets called lowered into an intermediate representation. That's what IR stands for. Um, IR tends to be pretty readable. You can check how um, Julia has passed your code um, into this sort of representation. Now, I've said a lot about how types are really important throughout. If you notice in our source code, there were no types there. I didn't tell it that these numbers were integers. I didn't tell it that they were floating point numbers. Uh, Julia has a very different approach to giving the, um, giving the compiler uh, the, this type information. And it actually comes in from the right hand side here. So method dispatch. Dispatch just means you're calling a function to it. But when you call a function, uh, you're giving it some data to uh, process and that data will have a, a type because if it exists in memory somewhere, it has some representation. And so Julia will use that uh, type information to sort of inject it into the compilation process here. 
that's very different from how most languages do it. Um, but we'll cover that more, more later. So at this step, you have some type information plus your sort of source code in this intermediate representation. And then it goes through a few more translation steps, um, also optimizes the code um, as well. And ends up in the what's called LLVM IR. So this is another intermediate representation, but it's it's the different one to the Julia intermediate. And I'll just cover very quickly what LLVM is. And it's basically a sort of technology that helps make writing a new language very easy. It sort of provides a middleman between um, your code in the language or your source code compiler and um, sort of compiling the machine code. So LLVM basically provides like a sort of front end for Julia to use. So you're like, this is how you translate my Julia intermediate representation into the LLVM representation. And then with the LLVM representation, you can generate the machine code for any or pretty much any platform out there. So it can go for x86 or ARM or uh, like very old uh, processors that have not been sold for like 30, 40 years. Um, and so this technology is used in quite a few languages. I've just given some examples here. Obviously, Julia. So Rust, if anyone's heard of Rust, uses LLVM as well. And also uh, like C and C++ have a compiler that basically is just LLVM. Um, it's called Clang, if anyone's used that before. Also, interestingly, uh, you can find it in the Python ecosystem as well. So if any of you have used number before to try and uh, optimize your code, the compiler that it's used, it does like just in time compiling. The compiler that it uses is LLVM under the hood. Uh, unfortunately, it's not an acronym for anything. I don't know why, but I always like to think of it as low level virtual machine. It helps me remember, but yeah, it's it's just the name of the project. So once we've got this LLVM intermediate representation, we pass it off to LLVM and that generates our native code that can run on our specific processor. And from there, we can just execute the code. Uh, so most of this process, you don't need to know anything about uh, in detail, but um, sometimes when you're optimizing, it can help to actually inspect um, the output of these steps at certain times along the way. So you can see these at code types, at code lowered. Uh, we'll go and use them and actually see what the output is. So yes. Uh, so this is the Julia REPL. REPL just stands for read, evaluate, print loop. Basically, you can send it instructions one at a time and see the output as you're going, kind of like a Jupyter notebook. So essentially, we can define our function in here. So we had 5x squared minus 2x plus 1, I think. Uh, and you can basically just like call your function like normal and see the and see the results uh, that come out of it straight away. But we can inspect what happens at each of these points. So we can see here that the sort of lowered intermediate representation generated by Julia looks basically the same as our code. It's just broken down this longer expression into uh, more manageable chunks. So first it does the 5x squared term, then it calculates the 2x term, subtracts them and then adds one at the end. Um, and it inserts these little symbols like percent three, percent four, et cetera, et cetera, just to uh, sort of break up the um, break up the code into smaller parts. So then, what type of uh, multiplication algorithm does uh, this use? Uh, so the multiplication is uh, basically implemented on the CPU. So there's like a special unit called the... No, no. I mean, what type of algorithm does it use for multiplication? Was there different ones? Does it use the standard one we use like in school? Multiply one by one? Uh, if you have big, big numbers. It's, it's literally hard baked into the processor. So it has special... Oh, okay, okay. So it has a special unit called the arithmetic logic unit. Um, 
that will be able to uh, out, output the multiplication or the addition or whatever. So it doesn't go through any of the steps to manipulate the bits one by one. It just does it in one clock cycle. So you put in the two numbers, it will output. There's no, um, yeah, there's no like iterative process along it. Uh, that's actually different in Python. Python doesn't use machine types for integers. It uses big ints, so it can grow to any size. Um, and that means it has to basically write a for loop and go through um, all of the things. So integers are very um, badly performing for like large sizes in Python. OK. So uh, we'll go to the typed version. So basically, What's happening here is I'm calling this function f with an input of five, and it knows that five is an integer, and so it will pass that information uh, to the compilation process. And here we get basically the same output, but it's just labeling what the types of everything is at each um, at each step along the process. And you can see instead of having the multiplication, it's lowered it to some internal method in the Julia library that multiplies integers together specifically. So now if we go to the LLVM, so this is when it gets converted to the LLVM IR, I am going to just take off some of the debug information so it's easier to read. And you see this is pretty similar to what we had before. We have some instructions. This I64 means a 64-bit integer. It has all of the types that it knows about here. Again, pretty simple code. Um, it's also hard uh, coded the um, constants that we use in the function directly into the instructions themselves. But if we go all the way down to the native code, uh, you can see it's it's a lot harder to read, but essentially it's the sort of same instructions. Uh, code native is uh, quite hard to read. I, I don't think you guys will ever need it, but code types is quite useful for making sure that the compiler knows what types you're using. Um, uh, where is this uh, your input encoded? I mean, I don't I somehow, for example, encode the type. I don't see. I mean, this file. I mean, you input into a function. Yeah. So let's take an example. So if we have a equals five, that gets set. And if we say type of a, the yeah. sort of runtime knows that a is an integer. Mm -hmm. We have another value, b. We can check the type of b is a float 64. Yes. Um, and well, I mean, in the, in the code above, I mean, just yes, of course. So if we have a look at uh, code typed, we're calling our function f, yeah. and we're actually giving it the value of a. So the compilation happens when the function is called. Again, this is strange in Julia, but it happens um, basically based on the input argument. So if we have a look at the type here, it's the same as before. It's the, like five, I mean, somehow the value of A is included in this coding. The, the it's just the type. So, just okay. so basically when you when you compile, all it knows is the type of A. It doesn't know the value, value. inside of A. I see, I see. And what happens is it caches this compilation process. So if I were to type in f of 100, it wouldn't recompile the code because it's like, I already have compiled code for integers, and my, this input is an integer, so I'll just use that cached compilation. Um, if, however, we were to change the input type to b, now b was a floating point number, you can see this is generates different intermediate representations. So uh, the code that's generated changes based on the type of your inputs. Um, you can like hard code your type. So you can say um, like another function g, which only takes um, integers as an input. And let's just say it, it does, it multiplies it by five. So now if I call g, it will compile it again. Uh, type g at five. And again, it just multiplies it by five and returns it. But then if I try to call G on five, it says that there isn't a definition for it because you've restricted the type information to only be integers. Now, that's the sort of basics of the sort of compilation process. Um, what I will show you, which is quite nice, is we'll write a slightly larger function 
um, that just sums up some numbers. So if we do a for loop, so we say for all of the numbers, i in the range like one to like 10,000. Oh, sorry, I've missed something. We're just going to add up all the numbers from one to a thousand. So we say s plus equals i. So each iteration of this loop, the variable s will have the variable i added to it. And, and then return s. Uh, you'll see part of the syntax here. It's quite like MATLAB. There's end keywords. Yeah, it's just syntax. It's not anything to be too concerned about. So if we now call my sum, there's no inputs here. Um, it knows all of the types at compile time because these are just constants that I wrote in. So it knows what the type is. Um, you see it gave that sum like very quickly. And if we actually look at the um, information, sorry, not the code types, the LLVM, you can see that there's no for loop here. It just pre-calculates the value and outputs it. So if you have any constants in your code that the compiler can sort of work out beforehand, it will optimize your code by um, basically pre-calculating um, any any constant values. This is called constant propagation, and it works um, very very well. So this results already uh, uh, already got calculated during uh, during compile time. Yeah, um, I don't even think it runs the for loop. It can it knows that it's a for loop, and it will basically use the formula to work out the sum of the integers from these two values as well. So if you have a look at the time it takes. Um, it's it's a very short amount of time. Uh, usually when you're timing, you should use um, benchmark tools, which runs it um, many, many times. But it only takes like two nanoseconds to do this. Um, and when you're getting into the nanosecond region, the timings can't really be trusted. It's basically one CPU cycle. Now, you can see that it basically just returns the constant. Because if we change this to uh, a much larger value, you can see, again, it's the same speed, even though it's you're writing more loops into it. So any information you give the compiler at compile time that's a constant, it can use that to sort of um, optimize away a lot of operations. And that's a big part of how Julia manages to get quite quickly is the compiler can be quite smart because you're giving it some type information even at runtime and it's able to uh, use that to generate this really efficient sort of machine code. Okay, I'll stop uh, the demonstration there. Uh, okay. Not while I'm writing the code. So the first time that I run the function, that's when it gets compiled. So Julia uses like just ahead of time compilation. Um, so yeah, the first time the function's called, it'll run the compilation process. Um, but again, for that for that example I use, it won't actually run the for loop. Usually, sometimes it does. If it can't infer it, it has some nice heuristics and uh, like formulas it can use to basically calculate what the value should be without running the loop. Does that answer your question? Awesome. Okay, so just as a summary for next session, um, bring your laptops if you can. Uh, it'll be a sort of half and half I'll do um, part of like a lecture like this, sort of introductions and like live coding stuff. Um, and then the second half will just be trying to get things working on your end and I'll be around to sort of uh, answer questions and things. Uh, for next session, it would probably be good if you all create a GitHub account by then um, and also accept the assignment. So I sent this out in the email. Uh, hands up who's actually accepted the assignment already. Great, and you can access the code fine. Okay, good. Um, so in the assignment, 
Uh, it's very simple. Do you actually need to get full or anything on just to get a passing extension on VS Code still for you? As long as you can work with it locally, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so the README contains. So the README contains a lot of instructions uh, for how to get started uh, and basically guide you through what the tasks are. Um, it has instructions for all of this, but essentially you need to install uh, some software. So Git um, and GitHub Desktop, I recommend for people who are new. If you're already used to Git and you know how to use everything, just use whatever you're comfortable with. Um, you also have to install Julia. Again, there are instructions in the README for that. Fairly straightforward. And we'll be using VS Code for all of our development here. Uh, does anyone have any issues with that at all? No, great. Uh, pretty much the only supported editor. So there's, there's not really much choice you have for this. Um, but VS Code works with extensions, and so it can basically, you can code quite nicely in any language, but the Julia extension is going to be important. Okay, that's everything. Any any last minute questions? No. Oh. Okay. I'll stop the recording and if anyone has any questions, you can come up and ask me afterwards.